This is the new Kia EV6 GT. It's a four-door all-electric that's loaded with features and performance. We have a full review plus test drive right now on Driving Sports TV. Here we have a car that puts out 576 horsepower and 545 pound-feet of torque. It's got dual motors and all-wheel drive. And if you're surprised that this is a Kia, you just haven't been paying attention. This is, of course, the same company that brought us the Stinger with 368 horsepower and torque vectoring all-wheel drive. Of course, that was a petrol-based car. This is an electric. So what we have here is the natural evolution from that same kind of idea. Before we take it on a drive, let's take a closer look at what we have here. The EV6 GT that Kia sent us only has one option, floor mats. For a total price of $62,865 US dollars, including destination. The standard battery on this trim is a 77.4 kilowatt hour lithium ion unit. That provides an estimated range of 206 miles, which is on the low side for a battery electric, but it shouldn't be surprising considering the 576 peak horsepower. <laughs> Spoiler alert, the Dodge Hellcats aren't economical either. But the limited range may not be that big of a deal in actual practice, considering the EV6 GT can charge from 10 to 90% in less than half an hour. So you might be charging a little more frequently than competitive vehicles in the class, but you're not going to be charging for as long. Of course, most buyers will be charging their cars at home, so this may not be an issue at all, depending on your personal use case. Speaking of charging, the Kia does have one party trick I kind of wish we'd see on every battery electric, the ability to act as a power station. And because the EV6 also acts as a generator, you just tap off its battery, plug in your tools, and you're good to go. It even has enough power to charge another electric car. Where most battery electrics will have a front trunk, this one, only has a tiny little bay. So technically it has it, but you really can't put much in here. Uh, really, the whole point of this front area is maintenance fluids. You got washer fluid, you got brake fluid, uh, and then you also have the traditional battery up there that is also used by the vehicle. So lots of stuff all packed together for easy maintenance. This being a performance vehicle, it naturally comes with performance tires. These are Goodyear Eagle F1 summer tires wrapped around a 21 inch wheel. You can also see the performance brakes right there. This is a 25540 R21. And yeah, because this is a summer tire, we will not be doing any off-roading today. In the back, the EV6 GT has 24.4 cubic feet behind the second row. Fold all seats flat for up to 50.2 cubic feet. There is no spare, you just get a fix a flat kit. Now let's take a look inside. This being an EV, that means that it is built on a skateboard platform. That also means that my feet are raised because the floor is full of batteries. With my knees up here, hips down here, it feels a little awkward, but it's not too bad. It's comfortable. I am six foot one, legs torso proportion. I got lots of room for my feet. My head is not hitting. And then I also get a fold down armrest uh, with integrated cup holders, making this a pretty comfortable place to hang out. Down here, I have two USB-C sockets for charging. I also get my own vent. Inside, oh yeah, these are comfortable seats. They feel like proper racing shells, but they almost feel custom fitted for me. Yeah, these, these feel great. Now it is interesting that this uses manual controls for the seats. Uh, they say that's to save weight, yet they did include a sunroof, which seems to me like, I don't know, that just doesn't seem necessary. That could have saved a lot of weight by not including that and then give me back my power seat controls, right? Although this isn't too bad, I'm okay with it. So in terms of layout, I really like this setup. This is something that we've seen in other Kias. Uh, they're using the 
dual displays kind of mesh together so they looks like one big unit. Uh, each of these screens is 12.3 inches. They're wide screens. They're really nice clarity, good color. Um, and I love the graphics on these things too. They are fantastic. In the main gauge cluster up here, we have all the stuff you would expect. Especially neat is that we have um, a drive mode connected layouts. They're all different sport, normal, eco, uh, they all give you a slightly different layout. And then also, uh, going into GT mode, you get a fourth layout. I mean, they're all very similar, but the colors and the slight design changes, uh, it's just really nice, easy to see that you are in whatever mode you want to be. And they definitely use that whole kind of neon green uh, uh, to good effect here because you of course have the neon green brake calipers, you have it on the piped stitching on these seats, it's on the steering wheel with the contrast stitching, and then you also have it on this GT button. And then when you hit it, it changes the gauge cluster to also have that same color. And it is like perfectly matched. The designer in me is giving them props for that. So often manufacturers will have like a real world color, but then when they put it on the screen, it's eh, vague. This is actually properly matched. I like that. Now this whole design is actually really cool. Um, electric cars really free designers to use the space a little bit better. Sometimes they end up using it better. Sometimes they end up using it worse. I think that the actual usable space in this vehicle is quite good. The infotainment system does use another one of those 12.3 inch screens and it's it's really nice it has this really simplified layout on the main page uh, with the battery status front and center um, i can click on any section of this to dive directly into where i am uh, i can go to the navigation system there and this does include navigation um, i can also go directly to radio and this supports terrestrial xm satellite radio um, also, you can do Apple CarPlay. It does not support wireless Apple CarPlay though. Typical with Kia and Hyundai and their higher end systems, does not support wireless, which is a little weird. Uh, they do include, however, a wireless charging pad, and uh, that would be nice if it worked, but because this is an iPhone 14 with the large camera module, it cannot sit flat because the module lifts up the surface from contacting the charging pad. Now, that doesn't mean that this doesn't work on all flat charging pads. Uh, we also have a Toyota Highlander right now, and it apparently has a powerful enough pad that it works. This one does not. We have a nice bin down below here to put a large bag. We also have a couple of extra power sockets, a USB-C and a 12 volt. And then above that, we have a USB-A and another USB-C. This vehicle is not lacking for power sockets, that is for sure. Jutting out over that is what appears to me as a Star Trek inspired console. Uh, up front, we have steering warmer. We also have seat warmers. Below that, we have the start button. And then there's a big knob here for drive, neutral, and reverse with a parking button in the middle. Uh, my only complaint with this is that the plastics feel a little cheap. For something that you're engaging with every single day, I would prefer better materials here. We have parking sonars here, and then we have the camera unit here. Now, the camera button actually has two functions. Uh, number one, it is to turn on the camera, uh, which is a nice surround view system. The other long hold puts us into uh, auto park mode, which personally, I don't like auto park. I find it slow. I'm just not confident with the vehicle parking for me. I had one issue several years ago of a Ford almost driving over a fence. Luckily, I put my foot on the brake in time. Uh, but after that, I've always been a little sketched out as to letting the car park for you because ultimately I'm the one responsible. So not a favorite feature, even though everybody seems to add it to their cars it's also like the slowest way possible to park so not my not my it's just not my bag of tea the steering wheel of course is wrapped in this nice uh, leather like material uh, we have paddles and no they are not paddle shifters because of course this is an electric with direct drive uh, so what they are is for controlling the recharge levels everything from level one to max which is basically an eye pedal like configuration where you use one pedal to accelerate you release it and it's practically braking uh, we'll test that out as we're driving in just a little bit but yeah overall love this layout uh, the meridian sound is quite nice and that comes on this trim uh, we have a heads-up display which is pretty basic as far as heads-up displays go 
I got speed and directions on it. It's okay. Even though this is a performance vehicle, it still is loaded with all the safety stuff you would want in 2023. You have blind spot warning, collision mitigation, rear cross traffic alerts with auto braking. You have parking sonars. Uh, it also has adaptive cruise control with lane centering and lane detection. So yeah, all sorts of good stuff here. But this vehicle isn't about necessarily the amenities, although they are nice, it's about performance. So let's go take it for a drive and feel the performance. Missed opportunity, this should be Kia Performance Green, right? Page out of the Porsche book, let's do this. Okay, so here we are in the Kia EV6 GT. I've actually been really excited about driving this one because <laughs> it's not a normal car. This is a high performance, dual motor, all wheel drive electric. And yeah, there's a few of those. And yeah, I've driven a few of those, but I really enjoy them. I really do. So one of the more shocking things to me is that on paper, uh, this vehicle is either as fast or faster than a Porsche Taycan 4S. That is huge. Now it depends on who's testing it, of course, and the testing parameters. And no, I don't have a Taycan 4S available to do side by side with this one. Uh, but I do have the ability to test the zero to 60 and let's just see what a real world number looks like. Also, I am curious, does GT mode really make that much of a difference? Or is the zero to 60 fast no matter what mode you're in? I think we need to find out. Okay, we're in a kind of level surface. Let's give this a try. And three, two, one, go. What? Oh, my face. And 60 in 4.1 seconds. Now let's flip this around and do the exact same thing, but in GT mode and see if we can go even faster. Okay, I'm gonna pop it into GT mode. Boop. And three, two, one, go. Oh, mercy! <laughs> 3.45 seconds. So yeah, GT is a lot faster. Oh, that was, that was pretty incredible. Wow. GT mode is really meant for the track, so I'm going to go ahead and switch it back to sport mode, which is still pretty darn quick. Um, just, just not really as quick as GT. And uh, let's see, we got some punch here. Yeah, we still got some punch. Wow, this thing is nuts. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, now that my mind has been warped, uh, let's look at some of the other features. Now, this gauge cluster, I rather like it. There's a little power charge indicator on the right, which is really neat. It's just a really very clear design. I have all the information that I want, and it's represented in a way that is unique, but also easy to read. Love that. Um, as I change between different modes, oh, modes are over here. Uh, it also gives me roughly the same data, uh, although it is slightly different. Uh, and that's nice, you know, just minor changes, that's all you really need. That's interesting to note here that the primary drive seems to be the rear wheels. That is the, that is the motor that is engaged the most. And that, that makes sense because this vehicle really feels like it has a rear bias in most driving situations. You feel it like you're being pushed instead of being pulled. And that is because, yeah, it is the bigger of the two motors. And Whoa, that is nice. So regarding the drive modes, there is actually quite a lot different in the way that the vehicle behaves depending what drive mode you're in. Obviously, Sport has really good levels of performance without being absolutely ridiculous like the GT mode. Moving on to normal, it's a nice balance. And then if you go to Eco, it really, really constrains that throttle so you're not snapping your neck at every start. And I think some people might actually like that. And of course, it'll let you eke the most mileage out of this setup, which is good, you know? If that's if you're just commuting, you don't need to be racing, right? Eh. Cruising here on the highway, it's really quite pleasant. It doesn't feel like it's a, you know, high-strung performance car. I'm going to switch back to normal mode. And now that we're kind of entering a little town here, I'm going to 
go all the way to maximum regen, which is otherwise known as the eye pedal mode. That means I can use a single pedal to drive. Um, as I put the throttle on, it drives. As I lift it off, it uses maximum regen and also brakes. So that way, it's kind of more like a video game. This was, of course, initially on the Nissan Leaf in the US and other vehicles have added it as well. It's kind of a special electric style of driving. Personally, I'm not a fan of it. I'd rather free spin when I'm not putting uh, the throttle on. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn that off, but I am gonna leave it probably around level two of electric regen. The maximum range on this vehicle is just over 200 miles. And you know, yeah, there's definitely plenty of electric cars that'll go faster and go further, but they're also way more expensive. They're all over $100,000. And you also end up with a vehicle that is very, very heavy, uh, very large. It's just a different kind of driving experience. I think this is a nice balance of ultra high performance at the same time having a range that is very usable. And even though you might be charging more often, the fact that this recharges so incredibly fast, it's just not that much of a hassle so long as you have access to a DC fast charger when you're doing long distance trips. Now, the current state of US fast charging networks, eh, that's a different topic altogether. Uh, but most people will be plugging this in overnight with level two charging at home. And for that, you know, that's the cheapest way to recharge. It's the most convenient and it's what most people will do. And it's especially neat that you can get like a uh, breaker switch on your house to be able to plug this vehicle in and have this vehicle power your house like a power brick. It's really, that for me, that is kind of the future. Cars have so much more use to them because you're dealing with this massive battery pack that yeah, you can use it to go zero to 60 in 3.45 seconds, but you can also use it to power your house, which is a much easier thing for a battery pack to do. It's far less strenuous to run a refrigerator than it is to push a 4,000 pound plus vehicle forward with ungodly speed. You could probably run your house for several days off of this battery pack if you wanted to. You know, good for power emergencies, that kind of stuff. But regarding the driving here, this is actually a really comfortable car. Even though they're sports seats, they are comfortable. I feel very supported. There's no hot spots. Um, I feel like I could drive pretty much forever in this thing. Now, if you are doing a long road trip or you're just doing the daily commute, you can always use the adaptive cruise control system. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it on and you can choose to be either lane centered automatic or you know not do that and just do notification of lanes. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it on all the way here. I get a little green steering wheel up there. I set my target speed and now it'll gap the vehicle in front of me. Now, granted, this is not a hands-free system. I'm merely doing this to show you how much input the vehicle itself is doing with the wheel. And you can see that it's actually really engaged in keeping me centered on the lane here. Now, this is a fairly tight corner up here, much corner, it's asking to put my hands on the wheel but it is doing a phenomenal job of tracking the middle of the lane here. Again, not a self-driving feature, but there is no self-driving features in the US. Um, I believe the only level three system, which is a closer step to self-driving is Mercedes-Benz, and they just got approved on that last week. Um, other than that, there's no self-driving in the United States, period. Sorry, it's true. <laughs> And, and that's a really cool thing about this vehicle. I mean, the adaptive cruise works really well. It's comfortable, it's fun to drive, yet when you really wanna like, you know, pop into GT mode and let the hammer down, ah, you can scramble your brain whenever you want to. <laughs> uh, this is an extraordinarily fun vehicle to drive. And yes, I can really see some people getting in over their heads because if you're on a moist surface, you turn the corner, you add the throttle, that is enough to like, you know, challenge some people's abilities to keep a vehicle tracking straight. Now, thankfully it does have stability control and all that stuff, but sometimes physics takes over and none of that matters. So that's kind of a, a, a note that I really want to express to people who buy cars of this level of performance is that the car won't save you from everything. Stability control, uh, it can only do so much. So I really hope that 
if you do get a vehicle like this, that you do learn to drive it and or you don't pop into GT mode all the time on public roads uh, because that does remove one layer of traction control. It just gives you an ungodly amount of performance at a tip of the throttle and uh, yeah, that can be dangerous, <laughs> which is awesome. <laughs> Actually, I, I, it blows my mind the level of performance that we're at right now. Now, is this as fast as a Tesla Plaid? No, it is not. Is it as fast as any human really needs right now? Absolutely. The Plaid is ridiculously fast, but you also pay a way more money than you do for this vehicle. I think it's almost twice as much as this vehicle. If 3.45 seconds zero to 60 is not fast enough for you, go out and get a Plaid. Knock yourself out. It's really funny because Kia has become more of a performance-based company over the last several years. Uh, that was their major differentiation between Hyundai. Hyundai kind of wants to be more like Toyota and Kia, they want to be a lot more like Porsche. And seriously, they want to, they, they have a whole racing program. They are developing cars based on their racing program. They want vehicles that are fast, fun to drive. Yeah, they might be based on a similar platform as several of the Hyundais, but the way in which they tune, market, set them up, it's different. And I have to say, I am absolutely stoked to be driving this vehicle. I love this vehicle. If I was in the market for an electric and I had a daily commute and I didn't do all the off-roady stuff that I did, I would totally consider one of these. Um, however, as it is, I need more off-road capability, even light trail capability. So this one really just doesn't check those boxes. Yeah, you could throw on some all seasons, you know, get rid of these summer tires, but you know, who are we kidding? That's not what this vehicle is for. It doesn't have the ground clearance. It's not designed for that. There's no trail mode. Uh, so yeah, just get that idea out of your head. So would I get this or would I get a Ford Mach-E GT? Well, this is definitely faster. That's for one. Uh, I think this looks better too. I do have some reservations at being a Kia simply because all the Kia dealers I've been to have not been places that I really want to hang out. My Ford dealers, at least locally, are a little bit nicer. And you do end up dealing with dealerships at some point. So, you know, for me, that actually is a little bit of a concern. But when it comes down to it, the level of performance that you get with this vehicle is nuts. The value you get with this in terms of level of performance, flexibility of this whole interior, the look, the feel, I totally think it's worth the money that they're asking for, if you can get it at MSRP. I know that's a little tricky these days. But if you can, this is an easy yes uh, for a performance all-wheel drive, all-electric. For Driving Sports TV, I'm Ryan Douthat. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, share our videos. We make them for you, and I hope you enjoy them.